Welcome, everybody. It is Tuesday afternoon. This is the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee of the Vermont House of Representatives. And we have on um, two things on our agenda today. We are going to address H750, which is the uh, bill that we passed out of this committee just before the break, uh, which allowed for the Adjutant General to be able to hire um, through his process a uh, uh, Provost Marshal, it's called a Provost Marshal, and we sent that bill to the Senate, and they have returned it to us with an, uh, with a concurrence with further amendment. They have two amendments that I believe I shared with you a, a link to um, last night. But first, we're going to start with Savan Cattell from the Spirits Council um, and the owner of, of um, of Stonecutter Spirits, and I just wanted to welcome him because he'll be transitioning, I think, and he just wanted to share some thoughts with us about the work that we've done and some of the concerns that he may have of us moving forward in, in this trade. So, um, Sivan, welcome uh, to the committee again, and it's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, greatly appreciated, and probably more of the former than the latter. Um, of the two things you just mentioned. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I asked Chair Stevens for a chance to say thank you to the committee uh, on, on my way out from the Distilled Spirits Council. Uh, as, as most of you know, Stonecutter Spirits hit uh, tough times last year, uh, you know, pre-COVID, and we ended up closing our restaurant in Burlington and our tasting room in Middlebury and working pretty hard on a restructure uh, ever, ever since. And that, that work is going well for very difficult work. Uh, but practically speaking, whether the brand survives, which I really hope it does, it would do so in new hands. Or if not, either way, by the time that you folks return in January, notwithstanding the, the other sessions that are potentially coming up before then, by that point, I, I will no longer be representing the, the spirits industry as part of the Still Spirits Council. You know, once, once I'm not part of Stonecutter, or once Stonecutter is not part of me, uh, I, I will be uh, politely stepping down from the Spirits Council as well. And, and all, all of my industry members know that. They, they asked me to stay on through the end of the session. So that was really the plan in the first place anyway. Okay, so, time, time, time out, Sivan, just for a second here. Um, we have a caller on the line. And I, uh, it, can you identify yourself, please, so we can write your name up on the screen? Is this, is this General Knight? It is General Knight. How are you, sir? Good. Um, we're going to put you back on mute, though, and we're going to change your name so we know who you are, and we're going to we'll be with you in a few minutes. Outstanding. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Sure. All that all that is to say, I wanted to thank the committee. Uh, you know, by by the time you folks properly return, at least next year, I won't be representing the DSCV anymore, and I've really appreciated the opportunity for all of us to work together over the years. I, I, I've loved this work. I really enjoy policy work. Uh, it's been wonderful to be part of all of the various legislation that you folks have put together that has helped not just the alcohol industry, but many industries. That includes, you know, when I've been in the committee advocating for paid family leave and, and other issues that, that were germane to my personal experience here in Vermont and where I've tried to help where possible. And I'm not a Vermonter born and raised. I, I moved here for work but I stayed here because I loved it. And when I have conversations with, you know, friends who are still in New York City and, and, and all those folks who say, well, you know, are you gonna stay in Vermont? The answer is always yes. And this committee and what you folks represent is a large part of that. And the fact that, that I've been able to be a small part of the various policies that you folks have put together that have helped grow industries Right. I mean, spirits is a very cool and, 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 you know, highlighted industry, but the real idea that we were growing and that we were growing because we could actually work with the legislature to figure out what things can and should be changed. And, you know, it's open conversations, not hidden motives. It's just actual real collaboration. And that's been a wonderful experience for me. So, you know, if, if, if I ever one day do follow my neighbor, Rep Byrong into public service, uh, you folks would all have played a large part in, in helping me be even interested in that in the first place. So just a, a personal thank you for me. I've really liked this work. Uh, I'll, I'll still be advocating for family leave, for expanding health care, 
all the other parts that I believe in strongly and the other boards I'm on. Uh, and certainly if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to address them. But for me to all of you, thank you, folks. Well, thank I appreciate, you. yeah, I appreciate that. And I, mm -hmm. I think we all do. Thank you for not yelling at us today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, save that for another day because your work, you know, as you've, as you've entered the building as an advocate and as a business owner and, and, and working for, towards your business, you've been, you've, you've acted in, um, respectful manner you've understood the process you've learned the process you've worked with us in ways that i think really moved the industry along um and added a added a perception of the um i mean you're one of those godforsaken young vermonters that we claim never moved to the states so you know you did and uh and you've been doing good work so and and i and i if i remember correctly you're still on the board at porter hospital so you're still in the in the fire of not uh, not not only Porter, but I'm also on the board of the Health Network, and I, I have so appreciated the opportunity to be a part of all of that hard work in these crazy, scary times. Yeah, so keep it up. Um, from my perspective, you know your opinions on on you know whenever you need to testify on any of the things that interest you, make sure you um, you you give us a call. I just wanted to say thanks for the reliable information that you were always able to provide to the committee. And I think that facilitated the work that we got done um, on behalf of the distillers in Vermont. And just for the opportunity to say thank you to, you know, my, my friend, neighbor and constituent, but also someone I've worked on boards with, with Main Street Alliance. <clears throat> um, I mean, working with you, Sivan, is honestly, the involvement that we engaged into the level that we have is one of the reasons I was inspired to actually run for the seat that I now hold. So, you know, we've kind of threaded a lot of this commitment together into like a unified approach. So thank you for that from me. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you all. You're, you're, you're making me blush and it was meant to be my thank you to you folks, not the other way around. So. <laughs> Well, I, I mostly just want to thank you for like not pressuring us for the time while we were working on the CRF proposal and waiting for a, a low tide moment like today, <laughs> because uh, as uh, it's not only the end, it's not even the end of session, but it's the end of session in spades in so many different ways. But it is, and it's been a unique place. But um, no, again, thank you so much for um, really for showing up. You know, it's it's really this work can't get done without people who want to see change made and, and you've represented your issues incredibly well. So thank you. Thank you all. Keep up the good work. I'll be rooting for you. And no golfing today. <laughs> Too hot. Too hot. All right. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, with that, we'll, um, so we have General Knight on the line. Uh, I have a note from Ron saying that Senator Hardy may be late and the attorney who wrote uh, these amendments is Damien. We haven't seen Damien. Do you remember Damien? Um, we haven't seen Damien in, in a dog's age or two. Um, but I guess what I wanted to, to just sort of preface it and, uh, and we'll do this a little bit um, piecemeal. We'll, we'll talk to General Knight about his impressions of what the of what the uh, amendments were while we have him. And then we'll hear from Senator Hardy and from Damien as they, as they come aboard. But if you remember uh, H750, and again, I think I shared the link last night with, for the amendments. And so um, basically the amendments, from what I understand of the amendments, the amendments do not change the bill that we did, they don't change any of the interior text of the bill we sent, but it adds this language that asks for a, um, oh, and Senator Hardy will be here in a second. Um, and so there will be, a, um, so it'll add language that adds a sexual assault reporting issue, uh, which has been an important issue for, for many folks in the, in the state house to get some form of, of more Better. We had a bill that actually asked to form a sexual assault officer through a different way. And then there's other language that I'm not as familiar with um, 
on the uh, officer part of it. So actually, I'm going to backtrack now that Senator Hardy has joined us. General Knight, thank you for your patience. Um, and I'm going to um, ask Senator Hardy to join us and tell us about the amendment uh, right into the right into the fire, Senator Hardy. It just I gave a very 50,000 foot overview of what the amendment does. If you could be precise, we don't have Damien yet to explain it from a legalistic perspective, but we do have General Knight on the line as well. But if you could, if you could do this and then you can get back to where you need to be, um, that would be great. Great. Thank, uh, thank you, um, Tom, Representative Stevens and the committee for having me. It's really a pleasure to see all of you in in sort of person. Um, I miss seeing everyone in the state house. I'm just pulling up the amendment. Um, we just finished on the floor. So trying to get organized. Um, so uh, no, wrong amendment. <laughs> Here we go. OK, um, the, the first part of the amendment um, would um, add language to the duties of the, the position of the provost marshal and the assistant provost marshal with respect to investigating sexual assault, assault charges in the National Guard and assisting lo, uh, local law enforcement or state law enforcement agencies in those investigations. Um, as you n well know, because I know your committee has done a lot of work on this issue, um, sexual assault and harassment is, is an issue. Um, uh, broadly speaking in society, but it's an issue that has been prominently um, uh, sort of discussed with, re with respect to the National Guard. Um, so my intent with this amend amendment was to make explicit that, that the creation of these positions would um, deal with investigating allegations of uh, sexual assault in the National Guard. Um, and then the second part of the amendment um, is to make explicit that um, while the provost marshal and the assistant provost marshal would have statewide authority because the st National Guard is a statewide um, institution, um, they would only have this authority with respect to the, the National Guard and, um, do, and the issues within the National Guard itself. They would not have um, civilian authority or um, have statewide authority with respect to um, anything beyond the National Guard. However, and this is what became a little bit complicated in the Senate was um, there is a distinction between the position and the person who may hold the position. Um, and I believe, and, and General Knight can speak to this um, more, but that the intent was that these positions may be held by members of the Guard who are themselves law enforcement agents. Um, perhaps uh, members of a local police force who are members of the Guard as well. Um, so it's not the intent to limit what that they are able to be law enforcement agents outside of their work as the in the Guard, but only as a provost marshal at, or an assistant provost marshal, the duties of those positions are for within the Guard themselves. The person may hold two different positions, just like many of us hold two different positions. We may be uh, a, a legislator and a restaurant owner, for example, but um, those are separate positions that the same person holds. Um, so that was the distinction. Once we clarified that it was the person versus the position, there was no opposition to this, um, just to make sure that in creating these law enforcement positions, it was clear that they were for law enforcement within the internal operations of the guard. So that is basically the amendment. And w once we clarified those, um, I believe they passed unanimously in the Senate. Okay, I have a question from Representative Walls. Yeah, thank you. I, I apologize, I don't have the amendments in front of me. I just looked at my email, I couldn't find them. So I wanna to go to that last point, the original bill says that they would be uh, level three law enforcement officers with the same uh, capabilities and immunity as the Vermont State Police. So your amendment changes that? Uh, no, it, it does not change. They would still be level three law enforcement agents, however, and, and would have all of the 
capabilities and immunities of a level three law enforcement agent, which my understanding is necessary to carry out the duties that are listed in the bill um, with respect to investigation um, and cooperation with outside law enforcement. So it would not change that. It would simply say that those duties and powers as a provost marshal or an assistant provost marshal would only be exercised with respect to the internal aspects of the guard, that they couldn't then use those powers and duties outside of the guard for civilian purposes. Unless, of course, the person themselves is a law enforcement agent, in which case they would exercise those duties in their other capacity as a police officer for the town of Montpelier or, or the city, you know, city of Virgins or whatever it is. So that was the distinction that's important to make. Um, there may be a time in the future that uh, the guard hires somebody for these positions um, that is not an outside law enforcement agent. Um, and that person would just have those powers and duties within the guard and would not be, a, they could be a landscaper or a restaurant owner. Sorry, picking on that because I know what he does. Um, but <laughs> uh, so that, that was the distinction. So no, they would still be a level three and have those powers and duties, but only within the guard itself. Okay, so it pertains specifically to their performance of duties within the guard. And just for clarification, because I might get asked this, this means uh, then they could investigate any uh, potential crime involving a guard member, whether that's on guard property or not, or military property or not. Yeah, I believe so, as long as they're acting within the duties of the guard and that the investigation was is related to a member of the guard as a member of the guard. Um, okay. So that it would be internal to internal investigations to the guard and to anybody's behavior or potential criminal activity as members of the guard. So it's a sort of internal policing mechanism uh, to to and you know I'll defer to General Knight on the wording of this, but to make sure that the the guard and the guard members as guard members are behaving appropriately. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Triano. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Senator, had has there had there been discussion uh, surrounding the possibility of um, a certified law enforcement officer who, let's say, is the sheriff of um, Chittenden County um, and becomes the provost marshal? Um, we did discuss some, and I. I don't remember a whole lot of what the discussion was like as far as uh, whether or not local state's attorneys or what role local state's attorneys will play um, in addition to uh, the provost marshal on behalf of the, uh, of the uh, National Guard. So it, it, I guess my question is that, it, you know, if you've got a sheriff in the same county in which an alleged uh, sexual assault takes place within the National Guard, then that individual is wearing two hats at that point. I guess I'm wondering if there was any discussion or thoughts about whether or not um, the um, outside prosecution, investigation and prosecution of that case, how that would work in with the National Guard and their um, uh, process of, uh, of um, uh, uh, judicial, uh, you know, whatever they call it, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Representative Troiano. Um, the discussion, and, and I wasn't involved in all of the committee discussions. Um, so I'm not a member of the Senate Governor, Government Operations Committee. I was involved in the discussion specific to this amendment, um, although they did discuss it a couple times when I wasn't able to join them. Um, however, um, my understanding is that this position would, they would not have the ability to charge a person with a crime. They would be able to um, investigate within the, in, uh, the National Guard and and cooperate with outside law enforcement officers um, in the investigation and in um, providing testimony or witnesses or or, or um, evidence. Um, so, uh, if the person is a Chittenden County Sheriff and a member of the Guard, I, I think like many of us, that person would have to be clear as to which position they are acting in. You know, are they a provost marshal of the 
National Guard or are they acting in their capacity as the sheriff of Chittenden County? It, and perhaps there may be instances where they might have to recuse themselves if, if, it, if it's a conflict. Um, however, um, and Damien can speak, uh, Damien Leonard can speak to this a little bit more precisely than I can. Um, he and I worked really hard on the language of this amendment to make sure that it was clear. There clearly are some cases where it, it, it will get a little dicey like it does for everyone in our small state um, on, a, on occasion when we're wearing multiple hats. But I think that if everyone is working with best intentions and being ethical and honest, those are things that hopefully could be worked out. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I mean, you hit on my point, which was um, if the sheriff's department is assigned to investigate that particular incident, um, it would be difficult for the sheriff to um, administer both duties at the same time. Now, you did mention recusing himself, but you know, I'm not sure how that works. I, I don't know. I guess they probably could, but, but that you touched on what was on my mind as far as... Yeah, and, and I will point out, um, there is a, an, a provost marshal, an assistant provost marshal, so it may be the case where the one of them has to recuse themselves and the other one would take over if there was an instant like instance like that. Yep. Thanks, Ruth. And this, uh, and I guess this will be for general night. I mean, this is, I think this is fine as far as it goes in, in, in my initial understanding of it. But I also seem to remember that the provost marshal was not going to be a part-time position. And I guess that'll be a question for general night that if this were a full-time position, that that person would be the provost marshal it would be higher. This is this is you know the hiring of the provost marshal, and not a part-time employee who has a second position. The assistant provost marshal is going to be a non-commissioned officer. Mm -hmm. You know, so that may that may affect at least some of the immediate issue with like with what uh, Representative Trano might have been talking about. But we'll get a clarification from that from both General Knight and um, and from Damien. Um, so that's uh, it's pretty clear. It's just those two pieces of, of um, amendment, and you didn't. The Senate didn't change anything else in the bill. So the so the primary language creating this position, creating what we are are trying to um, get to the National Guard is intact. So that 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 makes part of this easier. Representative Gonzalez, you're up. Still muted. There you go. No? Try again? No? All right, do you want to come back? All right. All right, so uh, Representative Gonzalez will come back. Um, any further questions for Senator Hardy right at this minute? And Senator, can you hang out for a little while or do you need to run? I believe I can hang out. I think my committee is is on hold. So I, I think I can hang out for at least a little bit, but I'll let you know when I ha when and if I have to leave. That's great. Thank you. Um, General Knight, um, hold on. Let's see if Representative Gonzalez's thing, did it work? Did your mic work? No. All right, we'll see you in a minute. Um, represent, uh, General Knight, <laughs> Representative Knight, not yet. Um, <laughs> General Knight, are you there? I am, sir, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing well. Where are you, uh, where are you testifying from? I am sequestered safely in my office at Camp Johnson. Okay, that's uh, air conditioned, I hope. It is. Good. Um, so if you could just um, share with us um, the process that you worked on with the Senate on this, on these two amendments. Um, again, we're putting you at a slight disadvantage because we usually would get the legal side of it first. But um, if you could just share with us your thoughts and um, on the amendments as they were as they were passed through the Senate, that would be great. Thank you, sir. And hello to the committee. I hope everybody's doing well. 
I, uh, I certainly appreciate the efforts to uh, get the bill to this point and, and appreciate Senator Hardy and, and Senator Perchlick for uh, working with, with uh, legal to get us here. Um, but everybody's on track in, in what the intent of this is and, and the clarifying um, language, I think, certainly helps out. But it is focused on addressing criminal activity within the Vermont National Guard. Um, the, we're working on a position description. I figured it would be good if I had the position first. Um, but to your point, uh, Representative Stevens, is it is initially a part-time job for a drill status, field grade officer, and senior NCO. Uh, now, there may be a point down the road where we have to revisit this if, if the need is there. Um, the only workaround that, that the deputy adjutant general and I can see at this point is that position becomes a state employee. Uh, my hope is that the criminal activity doesn't rise to such a degree where that's a requirement. Uh, but what this position does is it fills a niche that we currently don't have. Um, it, it certainly augments existing resources um, that I've got in place, but those are in large part administrative processes. So I don't have as significant a deterrent effect as I could by having a provost marshal team that would function as a liaison with civil law enforcement. And within the organization, with the sexual assault response coordinator, our state equal employment manager, um, and in speaking with the uh, judge advocate general at National Guard Bureau, um, it in essence becomes a compliance team for us. Uh, in addition, it would help us run our NCIC terminal here uh, with two trained personnel to do that, um, and also provide um, another resource to focus on force protection, uh, security assessments at outlying, outlying armories, um, so in the end, the amendments um, certainly feed the intent of the position. Um, what we do here, um, I think somebody had mentioned it, we do internal investigations. But in the end, those are largely administrative. So we assigned a, an officer to do an investigation who may have no investigative background. And, and they may at, at some point come across an investigation which is more complex than is expected. And, and that happens. Um, but what this position does, by having that logical liaison capability with civil law enforcement, if it goes beyond anything that we can deal with internally, there's a natural linkage with civil law enforcement. And then that team could provide, for instance, a supplemental affidavit um, to support uh, any criminal charges that will be forthcoming from civil law enforcement. I hope that helps. It sounds as if um, this helped clarify the positions for you, for the guard, because I mean, it was, I mean, uh, you were looking for, you were looking for a particular, the reason you were looking for this was because you wanted to be able to hire the person as the, as the tag, but um, there were, but also because of the difference. Can you go back and explain that, why, why we needed this legislation and how, because I'm assuming that this clarifies it a little bit for you. Because they're going to be a level three officer, it yeah. had to be in touch. Yeah. So since we were making them a, a level three certified officer, both of them, uh, we had to have that in statute. Like you would be um, Such as, yeah. So without, without that level three certification, what I have is another administrative tool. And it doesn't have the same impact on the organization as having a level three certified officer to function um, in a drilling status as a liaison with civil law enforcement. Okay, no, that's a, that's 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 great clarification. Again, it's been a long three months um, since we visited this this text. Um, Representative Gonzalez, and then Walls. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, fantastic. And um, I keep having internet challenges, so I'm trying to go in and out of video. Uh, so I apologize for keep bumping off up and and, and off. Um, so, Adjutant General, thank you for being here today and. As you know, I uh, am um, very persistent in looking at the sexual assault report. And uh, I'm wondering, and as part of what you also know from um, the years of, of chatting, is that the report that we've gotten from you all in the past is very anemic. And so I am wondering about the language in this amendment and how you are feeling about your ability to give us an a robust, meaningful report with the language that we have in this bill. Well, we'll continue to work with you, ma'am. Um, and we've actually just transitioned.
So we have a new state equal employment manager, uh, Duffy Jamison, and I'd like to set up a time where we could all sit down and, and kind of revisit uh, what it is that the legislature and the committee certainly would like to see in that report and, and give you enough fidelity um, to make that happen. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in being a transparent organization and giving you the level of detail required. That's great. And you think that in, in addition to this hire, but actually looking at the legislation that the Senate has put in this amendment, that that would assist you in having a more robust, uh, meaningful report? I do, ma'am. I, I think having another tool that can, and, and here's one of the challenges with, with the Guard, um, that, and not everybody may understand how we're constructed. So we have a, a duty to report. So for instance, if a Guard member uh, runs afoul of law enforcement and is charged criminally, uh, our policy says they, they are supposed to report to us that, hey, I got in trouble with the law. Well, that doesn't always happen. And we may not find out that there was a criminal charge on a member of the Guard uh, because a third of our force actually doesn't live in Vermont. Um, they are from throughout the Northeast. So it may be, uh, at least in one occasion I know of, a matter of two years before we found out and you had it, we had a soldier coming on orders to support for state active duty, the COVID response. And part of our process is to onboard them, to put them on orders, and that's inclusive of, a, of an NCIC check, the National Criminal uh, Information System. And only then do we find out that they had a civil conviction. So this team would get at that, and I think that in turn um, could feed some of the data that we may not be seeing currently. Wonderful. Thank you. Representative Walls. Uh, General Knight, this question is for you, and this is actually having to do with the uh, the second part of the amendment, and that is the, the authority of the provost marshal and assistant provost marshal. And I'm just wondering, uh, does, does this change have any kind of effect on how, how you might use them? No, sir. Uh, and this is something that I've, I've discussed with my deputy adjutant general here and our judge advocate general. The intent and inclusive in that position description is the focus is the Vermont National Guard. If, if anything, it, it clarifies that intent um, in statute. So that, that certainly meets my intent. Okay, thank you. Good to hear that. Well, that was one case, I think, when, I mean, an officer like this, do, do they not traditionally have um, the ability to respond to a crime? I mean, if they're driving home and they're, if they're off campus and they hear that there's something going on, do they have a right or responsibility to respond or if they're called in directly? Or will this language to not, you know, just stop that? Because, I mean, a, a, a level three officer, I mean, we've, we've taken testimony in the past that a, a, you know, a level three uh, officer who works for the Department of Liquor and Lottery can respond. Um, mm -hmm. But that's a balance between people saying, well, we want to make sure the guard stays on, you know, with the guard and isn't an additional state police force. Um, does that make sense? Yes, sir, it does. And this, this would go back to when I was the chief liquor investigator um, for DLC. And at the time, prior to statute change, um, our law enforcement ability was limited to the licensed premise. So in this case, um, if they're in a duty status with the guard and they see a criminal violation, um, they should be calling their civil law enforcement partners because they're on orders or on duty with us. The intent of the, of the bill and the intent of the position is, is limited to Vermont National Guard criminal activity. And if I remember correctly, we had to change the statute in order to allow liquor officers to act in a broader way. That is correct, sir. And, and there have been occasions, um, you know, when I was driving home after, uh, you know, doing inspections in downtown Burlington, and if I got behind somebody who was, you know, giving all the indications of being, you know, uh, driving under the influence, uh, that was a radio call to, to, you know, a local municipality or state police to actually initiate the stop, and then I would provide a supplemental affidavit. Okay, so that's, that's you know, uh, that's a real good clarification of, of 
yeah. um, of what's happened, what's a normal course of business under these circumstances with these kinds of um, with these kinds of limitations attached. Representative Triano. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, all certified uh, law enforcement officers in Vermont have statewide jurisdiction. So similar to what uh, the general was just talking about, um, including um, fish and game uh, wardens, they are often in on uh, on uh, uh, cultivation, marijuana cultivation busts. Um, so um, this person would have statewide law enforcement uh, jurisdiction. Uh, in the event that they were a sort of a, a level three certified officer. Well, what I just heard was that that there that this creates a limitation to their to that service to that statewide jurisdiction. Well, that's that's my point. I think that I'm not sure how that works, but um, uh, you know that's okay. It doesn't it doesn't matter. I just thought that um, uh, when we think of, in terms of certified law enforcement officers, um, uh, that um, they generally have statewide jurisdiction. But if we want to limit that, and that's, that's part of what we're uh, doing here as far as the, uh, uh, the provost uh, position, then I, yeah, I'm okay with that. All right. So just to, to clarify, I mean, again, that, that's something that existed with in, in in the general's case and in the case of the our portfolio that's something that happened with the liquor officers right um which changed about i, I want to say five or six years ago yeah, um, there, I think, yeah. that changed where they were allowed to do traffic stops out of the blue um not in their jurisdiction whereas this is limiting their jurisdiction to guard when when off campus to guard related crime right understood did i get that right general and Senator, is that is that really what we're what, how this limitation has been shaped? That's correct, sir. Okay. Yep. Senator Hardy. Yeah, um, Representative Stevens and Triana. Yeah, that that is that was my intent was to limit okay. it to the guard, and you know I think it's uh, perhaps goes without saying, but I'll say it that in in this current um, situation with. Um, uh, the national scene on police brutality and police uh, actions. Um, my intent also was to make sure that as we're creating two new law enforcement positions, that those law enforcement positions would have the specific duties within the guard itself and not have civilian duties. Um, and so I think I, I thank the, the general, first of all, for understanding that and underscoring that with the way he's creating these positions. But this is, the intent was to limit their jurisdiction to the guard only. Um, and if they happen to be law enforcement agents outside of the guard, then that would be in their duties as law enforcement agents outside of the guard. Um, so, yes. Representative Gonzalez. Okay, so not a question, but just uh, following up on both of those statements that we, uh, as reminding folks, since it has been a little while, we did talk about that concern that I had when we, when this was in our committee earlier. And so I really thank the Senate for being able to figure out some language to, to narrow that and uh, not just kind of general policing, but one of the topics of conversation that we had is potentially around immigration issues and, and things like that. So. So really having it meet the needs of holding guard members accountable and creating a healthy workplace by knowing what guard members are doing on and off the base and having that authority, but not an overreach of that authority. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that the Senate was able to, to figure out that language. Okay. Um, any further questions for either Senator Hardy or General Knight? Um, Damien is still in the Commerce Committee. Um, we can take a break. If there's no further questions for the folks, the witnesses who are here, um, or we can, um, I mean, I mean, I'm uncomfortable with voting without hearing from Damien just to do a walkthrough. So um, we will wait for him. Representative Kalaki. Oh, you put your hand down, okay. Um, so let's take a break. Um, we can have a committee conversation if we want. Um, 
Ron, you have something to? Well, I was just going to remind people the procedure for a break is uh, I put up a sign uh, on the screen saying that we've taken a break and that you mute your microphones and cameras. So um, I'm not sure how you, unless you just want to have a committee discussion, which is fine also. Um, well, I want to, so, so we'll do that. We'll do that if, if we choose to do that. But the first, before we let either Senator Hardy or General Knight go, first of all, Senator, thank you very much for work on this. Um, uh, it's good to see this come back. Um, yeah, thank you all for your work on it and for having me here to explain it. And if there are no other questions, I will leave to go to my other committee meeting, <laughs> but. Where there's only five of you. Right, so, exactly. <laughs> thank so, you, everyone. Uh, I appreciate your time and your consideration. And, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, please reach out if you have further questions for me. We will, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. And General Knight, while we still have you, um, if we could just change gears a little bit. And um, if you could spend a little bit of time telling us about the um, the guards, the COVID-19 response. I mean, we know through the news that there have been, um, that the guard built a potential emergency center up at Champlain Expo. We know that the, the guard has distributed MREs in, in several communities. Um, and I would just love to get your feedback, not just on what the guard did, but what you may have experienced just as a as a witness to seeing um, hundreds and hundreds of Vermonters in line looking, waiting for food um, and and, you know, what that, you know, how that may have affected, you know, the way that we're we should be looking at this crisis right now. It's more of a philosophical question. I'm sorry. I'm just going to throw it out while we have a little bit of time. But. Um, but I just want to make sure we, we know what was done um, by the guard and, um, you know, and what impact you think that made. Well, sir, I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I can tell you that, that one thing that, that we've learned from this is, is that our process and our systems work. Um, we've been refining them. Um, but to me, that the spirit of collaboration uh, between the governor's staff between agency of, of, of health and human services, commerce and community development, uh, the Vermont Food Bank, um, UVM, uh, all, all the uh, CEOs of the hospitals. It, it's been pretty remarkable to, to kind of watch uh, as things progress here. But as, as a, for, for an example, um, I am just continually impressed with, with the, the quality of, of airmen and soldiers we have in this organization. And, and they've actually, Vermont, the Vermont National Guard, um, on many occasions has become an example for the rest of the United States. And a prime example, as you mentioned, was that the Essex alternate care facility. And this goes back when we really first kicked this off. It was probably about two months ago now. Uh, we were having daily call-ins with the Chief of National Guard Bureau, the 54 states and territories, and the staff at, at uh, NGB. Inclusive in that was the Corps of Engineers. Uh, National Guard has a liaison, uh, Brigadier General, with them. And uh, when the governor asked, it was about seven days from the ask to actually standing up that facility and being open for business. And inclusive in that was hot and cold running water, power at every bed, um, so folks could charge their cell phones if we, if we needed it. Um, and we had all of our medical providers over there ready to go. And our civil engineers, it's important to understand this was neither Army nor Air, this is a joint venture. And it was our Air Guard civil engineers that came up with the, the, the plans to build it. It was actually our Army band who was central in getting the framing done in conjunction with those civil engineers and building junction boxes. And then the folks that worked in the background uh, were state employees that by, by any means necessary streamlined the contracting process, which would take days or weeks literally down to a matter of hours. So our soldiers and airmen never went without supplies um, to get that thing built. So having it up and running in seven days and the initial build out cost inclusive of personnel costs was about $235,000. 
And when I briefed that to the 54 and to the Chief of National Guard Bureau, uh, I immediately started getting emails from my counterparts in other states asking for the plans. How did you do it for that? Because the Corps of Engineers was building a 500-bed facility without the stuff that we had to the tune of $3.4 million. So that, to me, is, is the ingenuity that this organization brings in, in, in support to their communities. Um, over the past couple of months, we've, I think we're over 2 million meals distributed uh, at multiple sites throughout Vermont, and that's in conjunction with the Vermont Food Bank. So I've been to half a dozen of those myself. Um, Senator Welch came out um, to, to see what, what our soldiers and our airmen were doing. So there's been some legislative engagement on the national stage as well. Our Air Guard are running the Strategic National Stockpile Warehouse in Colchester. Uh, and they've gotten that pretty much down to a science, making sure that needed equipment and supplies gets where it needs to go in a very timely manner. Our uh, medical providers from our medical company with the, the Brigade Support Battalion and uh, our 15th Civil Support Team, I think as of today have crossed over 5,000 tests at different sites. Uh, they're focused a um, couple of different places now, but um, in every instance, when I talk to those soldiers and airmen, they are happy to be doing what they're doing. And they do it without complaint. And, and, and it's a reminder, I think, to all of us, this is our first mission. Uh, that's the beauty of the Guard. Because no other, to, in my view, active duty can't do what we do. So I'm just immensely proud of, of the collaboration within state government and, and with the Guard. And I'm certainly proud of our soldiers and airmen uh, for doing what they're doing. To, to your question on, on the food distribution sites, there were there were some concerns from legislators, well, from constituents to the legislators, that some folks were going to these food distribution sites and, and, and taking advantage and, and stockpiling or hoarding. That's not what I saw. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Gregg and I responded to some of those concerns. What I saw uh, were Vermonters in need, a, a lot of veterans, a lot of folks that are retired, a lot of older Vermonters. And in many instances, the folks that were there weren't picking up for themselves. They were picking up for their parents. They were picking up for the neighbors who, who couldn't get out of the house and do for themselves. Or they were working and still had a need. Um, so I didn't get a sense that, that um, there, was, there were a significant number of folks taking advantage. What I saw were people in need. Um, and I think we'll see that need. Uh, my hope is it tapers off as we start to open the economy back up because a lot of folks were – independent business people and they just they weren't open I, I, I talked to construction engineers they're not working because their work site's not open i talked to a, a young mason who was not working and he and his partner in their small business between the two families were 11 kids um yeah so the need is there but i i think as, as the economy opens back up and we put vermonters back to work um, that net need will taper off you have um, been preparing for a federal deployment. Um, have those plans changed given the COVID crisis? I mean, I'm, and I'll ask you what I've asked of ACCD and of, of AHS and everybody else who is, who's been responding to the COVID crisis. Um, is there, first, from the state perspective, do you have a, a cubicle set aside for emergency planning for the net? I mean, if there's a blowback, if there's a second or third wave of pandemic um, to take what you've learned and move forward. And, and is any of that planning postponing or changing the federal uh, call up at all? Uh, it, it is not, sir. Uh, that, that's been a point of discussion. But part of our planning process is to make sure that we retain the capability to respond to both missions. So even though a significant portion of the 86th Brigade combat team is looking at a deployment, as well as our law enforcement detachment and our public affairs detachment, which are two much smaller units, uh, it doesn't um, impact us to such a degree that we don't retain the capability to respond. Uh, the focus is less, for instance, on the Brigade Support Battalion which has been really in the lead in our response to the uh, COVID-19 crisis. And that unit, that battalion, will actually become our rear detachment headquarters. And their function is to make sure that families are taken care of and they're there, again, to take care of our first mission, which is taking care of our state. So we'll be able to do both missions. Um, the federal mission will go to three different combatant commands, European Command, Africa Command, and Central Command. 
And uh, right now, all I have is a notification of sourcing because National Guard Bureau is way behind on issuing an alert order. Um, so we're planning as if it's going to happen. We've been sourced as if it's going to happen. Uh, but until I get an alert, um, what that does, it actually makes it much more real for us. But in the interim, we're, we're continuing to drive on with planning, um, knowing very likely we're going to we're going to get the call. Okay. And did I hear you say that, in terms of the Essex project, that the that the National Guard, the Army Guard band, was instrumental, yes, like the 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 I don't want to say marching band, but the band that comes and plays at the State House. How did that, how, I mean, is that because they're made up of engineers and trombonists or is it because they're, um, what I, I just, that was such a, that's, I'm sorry, that stood out for me. Well, we like to consider the band as, as kind of our Swiss army knife. And, and that's one of the other benefits of, of the guard is everybody brings a different background um, to their drill. So in one instance, you know, I think she was a bassoon player, one of our young NCOs, um, during her um, college years over the summer would intern on a construction site. So she was in there framing and, and, and building panels um, in, conjunc in conjunction with the civil engineers. Um, and once they had instructions on how to build a junction box, um, there were, you know, literally dozens of junction boxes. So the electricians, when they came in to, to install them, didn't have to build them themselves. So it, it's just a diversity of background for us um, that the guard brings that really augmented uh, how things went there. It was efficient. Uh, and again, it was done in seven days, which to me was just unprecedented. I know it's a great argument for STEAM over STEM, so just to have a, make sure the arts are involved with, with all of the other STEM issues as well. Um, Representative Hango. Thank you. General Knight, I love your story about the Army Band. I um, play in a town band with many of the former members of the 40th Army Band, and they are a multi-talented group. So I just wanted to thank you very much, you and your airmen and soldiers, for the, the work that you did during this crisis and, and just the speed at which things were accomplished and, and how orderly everything went. I want to thank you for your leadership. Absolutely, ma'am. It's, it's an honor for me to be here to do it. All right. And um, Damien has joined us. Um, General, you're free to um, loiter if you would like. Um, if you need to go, you're, you can certainly head off. Um, but we, we were able to continue the conversation because our attorney has arrived. Um, if you don't mind, sir, I'll, I'll stick around. This, this is an important bill for me. No, that you're you are more than welcome to be here. So um, I just wanted to give you the freedom in case you needed to to, to head out. Um, so Damien, are you available? I am. There Hello, we go. stranger. Hi. How you been? Good to see everybody. I didn't yeah, get what? a chance uh, to see you pre haircut. Since I've seen yeah, you guys, got a haircut, I see. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would have liked to have seen the pre haircut look, but um, yeah, it uh, it's my second or third haircut of the of COVID. But so but but it's, your it's kids easy when you cut your own hair. I was gonna say your kids do it for you, right? <laughs> uh, not yet. They're good, but not yet. Yeah. So, well, well, welcome. Good to see you. Um, thank you. It's um. Yeah, you know, we'll cut right to the chase just to make sure. It sounds like you've been busy already today, and I'm sure, I'm assuming you'll have a busy week like us. But um, so to have you for this particular amendment in, uh, is important. We have an opportunity to, while we have you, just to hear. We, we know we heard from Senator Hardy, we've heard from General Knight, but if you could just walk us through the amendments, uh, that would be great if you could. Sure. Would you like me to throw it up on everyone's screen? Yes, please. And it is available right. on our page for people who want to read it on their on their um, computer. Um, yeah. So just to warn you, I I have been having some trouble with sharing documents. Um, so if that reoccurs, I may have to have Ron share it with you and scroll through it. Yeah. Um, 
So I'll, do, I'll do my best, but um, there's some some sort of weird glitch on my iPad when I try to share these documents. So. There's been glitches about Zoom for the last, <laughs> well, three months, but. Yeah. All right, uh, just a second here. All right, great. All right, so I'm sharing the Senate proposal of amendment. So the Senate essentially passed the uh, House bill, um, but under the duties of the provost marshal, they added uh, this item number four, um, which is to respond to allegations of sexual assault within the Vermont National Guard including reporting and documenting allegations of sexual assault within the guard, coordinating and communicating, and oh, that is the issue I've been having. Um, but you, you can't scroll? Well, no, it'll scroll and then skip right back up to the top of the page after a few seconds. So that, that's a, that's um, a spring issue. That's a, the spring inside your iPad is. Oh, you know, what I need are a few uh, guard members with mechanical skills to fix that spring <laughs> or to help me out with it. Um, so not to belittle their skills, but uh, yes, I'd love someone with the IT skills that I've seen with some of the guard members we have in our IT department here to help me fix this. Um, so the other piece is coordinating and communicating with the National Guard Sexual Assault Response Coordinator coordinating and communicating with federal, state, and local law enforcement in relation to allegations of sexual assault by a member of the Guard, and coordinating with state's attorneys and the attorney general in cases related to an alleged sexual assault by a member of the Vermont National Guard. Um, so we worked in the Senate. Uh, I think you've heard from Senator Hardy and, and um, the adjutant general at this point, General Knight. Um, and we worked in the Senate with uh, um, also legal counsel from the guard to get this language right and make sure that we weren't inadvertently um, cutting out uh, or hindering part of the sexual assault response process. Um, and Ron, I think I'm gonna ask you to share this because my document's just kind of going haywire on my screen at this point. Um, but, um, so that, that language was kind of the result of that work. Um, and I think as Senator Hardy probably already told you, her intent was to make sure that um, sexual assault was specifically called out um, in the bill and emphasized because that, that's a, an important issue that the legislature spent a, a fair amount of time on over the last several years. Um, in working with the guard and, and that the guard has also spent a great deal of time working on. So I see a question here from Representative Waltz. Okay, yes, uh, thank you. And I'm glad you're calling that back up. Uh, I find it kind of curious, it's C and D. Uh, it doesn't seem to address what if the victim is a member of the guard and the perpetrator is not. So I think, um, and General Knight can speak to this better than I can, um, but my understanding is that the, the guard has a variety of resources that come to bear in this situation. The provost marshal is, is a law enforcement resource uh, that can help with taking witness statements and coordinating with law enforcement officers in the actual response to the sexual assault. And then the sexual assault response coordinator um, and then other resources within the guard actually uh, can provide resources to the victims. So, and I, I would um, invite General Knight to kind of contribute at this point because I think he can speak to this much better than I can about how the responsibilities are divvied up within the guard. Are you there, General? Thanks, Damien, I, I can do that. So in, in the representative Waltz, in the instance where we, we have a, a victim or a survivor who is a guard member, um, 
we defer to that victim to work with a victim advocate and our sexual assault response coordinator, and we provide them the resources. Um, it is entirely up to them how they want to handle it. Um, there are two mechanisms. Restricted report means that they take no action, and that, again, is the victim's decision. Um, or if it's unrestricted report and the chain of command is notified, um, that allows us to have that liaison with civil law enforcement and, and uh, pursue prosecution for the perpetrator. Okay. I just found it kind of curious that it addressed only uh, a guard member who was a perpetrator, not one who was a victim. But thank you. Yeah, I, I think again, um, Representative Waltz, I would just note mm -hmm. that the 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 provost marshal here is is in the law enforcement role, um, sort of addressing the uh, inappropriate behavior, and then there are other resources in the guard that uh, assist the victims with um, with their needs and with their how they um, come forward regarding the claim and report it and providing them with assistance. So. I think that's what you're seeing reflected here. Um, and my understanding of, of um, Senator Hardy's intent here was certainly not to um, minimize the needs of the victim or the importance of providing assistance to the victim. Okay, thank you. I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with it, but it seems to put the perpetrator and the victim in different places. So. But thank you for the explanation. Okay. Are there other questions on, on that change? Representative Gonzalez? I'm, I'm wondering, Damien, if you can speak from the legal perspective on that um, in, in terms of answering Representative Walsh's Walt, Walt, question and concern, because you have such a deep background in um, that aspect of the law in general, and um, if if in that in your legal opinion, um, the the concern that Representative Waltz has is addressed in this language or not. So uh, I think that um, from from a legal standpoint, I think the the thing to keep in mind here um, is that you've you've got a number of different. Um, pieces and uh, levers that may be moving following a sexual assault. Um, and there are a number of different offices that may come to bear on it, depending on the, the particular nature. So um, if you have a criminal sexual assault, um, you, you have a law enforcement issue there because a, a law has been broken. And that's where the provost marshal um, particularly comes to bear, is that they're providing the they're taking witness statements and they're coordinating with law enforcement um, in sort of bringing the, the perpetrator to justice, if you will. Um, there's also a sexual assault response coordinator um, who, uh, and the victim's advocate who can work with the victims on that issue. Um, and then to the extent too that the sexual assault was involved with, for example, uh, sexual harassment, there may be an uh, equal employment opportunity issue, um, which the HR team at the guard, um, which I understand is in the process of being significantly strengthened, um, would, um, would come to bear at that point. Um, so the, um, the circumstances that we're dealing with, I think you, you've got a lot of different laws that are kind of um, coming into play. And there are different players that address each one of those aspects of the issue, whether it's, it's providing advocacy and support for the victim, um, or whether it's addressing um, an issue of sexual harassment or discrimination in the workplace that may um, accompany the sexual assault, or whether it is, um, 
you know, addressing the actual sexual assault, which requires coordination with law enforcement authorities um, to um, sort of uh, in, ensure that the the individual is is prosecuted and that the um, the occurrence is uh, fully investigated. Did, did that answer your question? I'm, I'm one, wondering if um, Representative Walsh, if that addresses your concern or, or fulfilled some of your, your thinking in that. Uh, not totally. I'm still pretty uncomfortable with it. It seems as if uh, the provost marshal kicks into action if the perpetrator is a guard member, but not if the victim is. And uh, it so, seems to be they should be equally involved in investigation, you know, if the victim is a guard member. So I I, I think the the provost marshal is involved with um, issues that involve guard members and issues that occur on base. Um, but one thing to understand too is the provost marshal is going to essentially be coordinating with civilian law enforcement where there may be greater law enforcement expertise. Um, and ultimately any case is going to be brought by civilian law enforcement here. Um, so, and um, again, General Knight can speak a little bit better to the existing process and where the Provost Marshal fits in within that. Um, and I, I understand your, your concern is that what, what if the, you have an individual in the guard who is the victim of sexual assault by someone from outside the guard? Am I understanding that correctly? Correct. Yeah, so it's, it's very clear. Um, the perpetrator is a guard member or if the assault occurs yeah. on guard property, that's pretty clear. Ron, you're still sharing your screen and we can see your email. <laughs> so yes, so you're exactly right, Damien. My concern is the victim is a guard member, the perpetrator is not, and it's not on, the assault did not occur on guard property. That just seems- So if the, like if the assault occurred off of guard property, that's a civilian law enforcement issue. Um, So, for example, if if um, you have a guard member uh, and uh, but they're assaulted um, when they're they're back home, they're not on drill. That's that's an issue that the civilian law enforcement would be responsible for handling, um, whatever the appropriate law enforcement agency is for that community. I I, I understand that, Damien, but it sounds like. The provost marshal would not be connected in any way with that sort of case. I think they ought to be involved in the uh, in the investigation. But but okay, I I don't want to belabor that. Okay, Just, Ron, Ron, can you scroll? Can you scroll down so we can see um, A, B, C, and D? No, the other way. The other way. The other way. Scroll up, I guess, right there. So the. Um, so it seems like Section A would cover what my concern is. Right, and I wanted to go back and see that. Not. <laughs> they seem to. But I also, but I also see. In, I also see in letter C that you know that that law enforcement in relation to allegations of sexual assault by a member would would be a victim or a witness relating those allegations. Right. Well, so there, there's also issues here. So if, if I'm a guard member and I, it's alleged that I committed a sexual assault while I'm not on guard, uh, not in my role as a guard member, but I'm, I'm back in the community, the guard is also concerned about that because that can affect um, the, the, if I've committed a felony when I'm off duty, um, the guard is definitely concerned about that. So that's another thing that the uh, provost marshal gets involved in here is coordinating with uh, local law enforcement. And also, if, if we remember the original bill, one of the things that 
uh, Provost Marshall would be heading up as the guards sort of keeping track of um, the crime information um, uh, databases there too, to, to ensure that, um, you know, that uh, you don't have instances where someone's committed a felony and the guard doesn't know about that when it, when it's occurred. And General Knight, again, can speak a little bit more to the importance of that role and how that works. But it, it's kind of important to remember that this is just one small subsection. And on the broader section, that, that guard member, the provost marshal and the assistant provost marshal are not only documenting and reporting allegations uh, of, of crimes that occur within the guard, but they're also coordinating with civilian law enforcement in terms of uh, finding out about allegations and they're, they're keeping track of when you need to do security check and so forth. Um, you know, they're, they're the ones who are going to be checking the crime information databases to see, you know, was guard member X um, arrested or, or did they commit a crime or something like that that we don't know about. Um, and so that, that's something they're monitoring. And I may not be explaining that very well. General Knight, again, can probably explain this a little bit better um, from the uh, from the guard's perspective. So I, I defer to him again and, and let him chime in here if he would like. No, I, I, I totally, I, I get what you're saying. And, you know, and I'm reading C, allegations of sexual assault by a member of the Vermont National Guard. I'm reading that as strictly perpetrator. But if there's a way to read that is the allegation is brought by a victim, okay, if it can be read that way. So, um, so I would say what you're what you're looking for essentially is is the language to say coordinating and communicating with law enforcement in relation to allegations of sexual assault that was either perpetrated by or against a member of the National Guard? I would say involving a member of the Vermont National Guard. That way it comes okay. the perpetrator and the victim. That, well, is, and, that is a shorter way of wording it. And um, I would, you know, just, and just, just for our purposes, you know, the question will be, um, again, when we get to the question of do we concur or concur with further amendment? Um, that's, that I think is, let's measure out whether that change is, whether that change needs to get done. I just, I'm just throwing it out there in terms of, in terms of concurring or concurring with further amendment. We can, and we can have that conversation after Damien is done, um, scrolling through. Yeah, I would recommend the same thing in D, C and D to, to say involving a member of Okay. But, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I think there's another question from Representative Hango. Yes. Thank you. It's actually um, maybe a clarification. I'm not sure for um, Representative Waltz. I hear your concern for the victim, and I read this in a different way. Subsection four, letter A, um, response to allegations of sexual assault within the Vermont National Guard. And that um, reporting and documentation within the Guard led me to just assume victims and perpetrators. So um, I was not reading it the way that you were. So I'd be interested to know if other committee members were reading it as um, you were or as I am. Thank you. I'm reading A the same way you are, Representative Hango, but it seems to me that C and D refine A in a way that I'm not comfortable with. A seems to cover everything, C and D do not. Yeah, I guess um, I think that A, B, and C and D together cover pretty much everybody, but my opinion, thank you. 
All right, so Ron is, um, we can go down to the second uh, section of amendment here. Yeah. And, and maybe Ron, if you can go back just a little bit. There, right there. All right, Sorry, Damian. I just realized I, I muted myself. Um, so the, um, what this basically, provides here is that the provost marshal and assistant provost marshal have the same powers and immunities as uh, all other uh, level three law enforcement officers in the state. The reference back to the state police is just standard language that we use for those. Um, so these are not special powers. It's the same as your local police. It's the same as uh, sheriffs who are certified law enforcement officers and it's the same as state troopers. Uh, it's the same as fish and wildlife game wardens. Um, so if we can scroll down to the next page, Ron. Um, the the, uh, the next piece here is, is key, and this was an adjustment. In the House version, it provided that the powers granted to the provost marshal and the assistant provost marshal may be exercised statewide. Again, that's uh, standard level three law enforcement officer language. Uh, the change with the amendment from Senator Hardy and Senator Perchlick was to say with respect to criminal activity in the National Guard only. Uh, and the concern um, there, which she may have discussed with you, was just the idea of creating sort of statewide law enforcement officers. Um, instead of just keeping the focus on the National Guard. Um, and then the last sentence there is just to ensure that uh, this paragraph couldn't be construed as preventing an individual serving as the provost marshal or assistant provost marshal, working as an officer in another, another law enforcement agency and exercising the authority, uh, the law enforcement authority granted to officers in that agency. So in other words, a lot of the Guard members are uh, their their uh, regular full-time civilian jobs are as law enforcement officers at our local police department or state troopers or uh, law enforcement officers within a state agency, something like that. And then they serve their part-time guard duty. Um, and this would allow them to serve as the provost marshal or assistant provost marshal. Um, and then while they're in, while they're wearing their provost marshal or assistant provost marshal hat, they're, uh, they can exercise that authority with respect to criminal activity in the National Guard. And when they're outside of their guard duty, they exercise their law enforcement authority statewide wearing their civilian law enforcement hat. Does that make sense? Okay, I see heads, heads nodding. Um, so that, that's what this is uh, here. Um, so this, this was the other change in the Senate was basically to limit their law enforcement authority while they're serving on, on, uh, uh, serving in their, their role as guard members to criminal activity in the national guard. Um, and then otherwise, um, they can in their civilian jobs, um, work as a regular law enforcement officer exercising statewide authority. I represent Toronto. Just um, to further Tommy's issues a little bit further, um, when a criminal investigation is launched, it is launched in a way in which um, it tries to determine the perpetrator of a, an offense. So um, a guard member who is not accused of anything um, is not generally involved in that investigation other than giving a statement as to what may have happened. So maybe we should be thinking in terms of um, some other type of support so that the National Guard maybe can consider um, coordinating with victims advocates, let's say, uh, to provide services to a member of the Guard who may be a victim of a sexual assault. Just my thoughts. Right, and I think um, just kind of 
Uh, two thoughts on that. One is that there are resources within the guard already related to that um, for events that occur within the guard. Um, the other piece is, um, you know, it may make sense um, to, to work on something um, related to strengthening the ties between the guard and civilian resources. Um, the question at this point would be whether this is the bill to do that in or, or whether um, that's something to address when, when there's a little more time to tackle that issue. Um, and I, I don't know enough about those resources. It's outside of my area of expertise to really talk to you about what exists outside of the guard um, and how you would most effectively be able to tie those together. Um, and that, so that, that's something that probably is, uh, would have a strong connection to the Judiciary Committee too, uh, who works on some of the victims advocate issues. Um, well, if a state criminal charge is brought, that and allows, are we all out? Oh, I'm on, okay. <laughs> that allows um, the victim um, uh, to uh, obtain um, services from the statewide uh, victims fund and victims uh, advocacy uh, network. Um, also the special investigations unit on sexual assaults um, outside of the National Guard would probably be uh, a part of this as well. Although that's, I think that's only uh, from, uh, for uh, juvenile assault. So that probably- Right, well, I mean, one of the things that um, General Knight emphasized uh, when we were taking testimony on this in the Senate is that um, typically the for something like a sexual assault, there are law enforcement officers who specialize in investing, investigating right. uh, those instances. And so the guard typically works with an outside law enforcement agency anyway, because uh, that expertise lies outside the guard. So if there is a sexual assault committed within the guard, uh, they're going to be relying on um, civilian law enforcement expertise that can help them investigate that. Um, that is so that, the FIU, the Special Investigations Unit that, that does that. Yeah, and I, again, um, the, um, so the, those resources typically lie outside and the provost marshal's role is to coordinate right. with those outside law enforcement resources um, and to, to kind of yeah. assist and facilitate the process. Okay, John, uh, Representative Palaki. Uh, th thank you. You, you know, I, I, um, I like these two amendments. They are clear to me. Uh, and I sort of with Representative Hango that Tommy's issues, I, I hear your issues, but I think it's incorporated in the language as, as I read it. And I very much appreciate the separation of that the National Guard is criminal activity at the Guard only, because we had discussed that. We had a separate bill uh, for that, that as well on, on the wall. And so th this is nice that we've incorporated that. I worry that if we make changes at this point that it just, uh, in this last week, that it's not really gonna be possible to get it back and forth, which, uh, so I actually would move that we, uh, I would say let's move, move these to this amendment as it is. Uh, I, I, I'm okay with that. I guess I make a motion, I'm sorry. I don't know how to say that, Chair, but I'm good with it. John? Well, that's, I mean, it's, I mean, the, well, that there's a motion on the floor right now to, uh, to accept the amendment as it's written, um, which would be to concur that, I'm sorry, the motion would be to concur with the Senate amendment. Uh, um, as amended by the Senate, we would be concurring with the with H750 as amended by the Senate. Um, if there is a second for that, um, we can continue the conversation, or we can wait to see a second. But I do have second. So we'll clarify that. Yeah. Tommy's going to second that. 
Representative Gamash. That was my intent to second it. Oh, you should just cut in and yell. And well. Yell. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, basically. You trained, me, trained me to do something and I, and I continually do it, so. <laughs> well, thank you, Eddie. In this case, um, so, the, so the, the, the motion on the floor right now is to concur with the Senate amendment. Um, and basically if, so, so for, I'm just trying to look at this from a timing perspective. It's 1.33 now, if we concur with this and it goes on the floor, then it goes to the, this will go to the governor to sign. If we want to consider Representative Walls' additions to the, um, to the amendment, um, we can concur with further amendment, but that would delay this bill being passed until August realistically and so i mean i'll just throw out we've heard i mean I, we've heard a good argument about making it more precise we've heard people interpreting it that the uh that the intent is there um i would i mean i will put it to you tommy how do you feel about moving forward with the bill as it is and um you know by the time by the time the the general by the by the time the guard gets a job description and gets us up and going and we've talked about we've talked um he just talked about having a new sexual sexual assault officer somebody that we should talk to and get to know in time um again is that something that is that something that we need to be hyper precise on today and what are you comfortable with well, I seconded it for a reason, because I do want to move it along. I would like to get this business done and not have to wait until August. I do have some concern. Uh, excuse me, Damien. Some sharp lawyer is going to look at that language and say, hey, doesn't apply to victims. Sorry. So, uh, but I do want to move it along. That's why I second, second John's uh, motion. Okay. Okay. Um, further thoughts on this? Um, I mean, General Knight, if you're still there, I'd like to just sort of give you an opportunity to respond to anything you've heard over the last half hour or so. Thank you, sir. Um, again, thanks for everybody's uh, discussion on the bill. Um, as noted, I think it's important for me. It's important for the guard. Um, coming back to the intent it will be incumbent upon us to ensure that we take care of our survivors, um, no matter who the perpetrator is. Um, I may have purview over somebody who's in the guard, but Damien is correct. If there is a perpetrator and the survivor is a guard member, we defer to the survivor on which action to take. If the survivor decides to file an unrestricted report, that will give us the opportunity to immediately start liaison with, for instance, as mentioned, one of the units for special investigation. Um, we have a robust victim advocacy here. Every unit has victim advocates. Uh, we have a, a robust sexual assault response coordinator and, and the team that's associated with that. So it's, it's great to have a response. Um, I, I want to get out of the response business. I want to get into the prevention business. And that's why I think this bill is important. So when we get that position description done, um, we will obviously align uh, much of what they do uh, with what's included in the bill. Um, I want to eliminate it in this organization, and, and the intent of the bill, I think, gets us closer to that. All right, thank you. Um, any further comments from committee? Representative Gamash. I move that we move this bill along that we vote on it, the, the amendment. Let's, okay, we, let's we've, got, it. we've got that motion on the floor and we've got it seconded and we've got it thirded now and that's- um, Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's I think okay. the has gotten to me today. If we're not punchy on June 20, whatever this is, then- um, You meant to call the question, Mariana. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> there you call go. the question on voting on the amendment All on right. the bill to get it on the amendment. So I'm not so, doing well today. 
both. Okay, so the, the action on the floor is, um, uh, do we concur with the Senate's proposal of amendment to H750? And it's been seconded. Um, clerk may commence to call the roll. Representative Walls? Yes. Representative Gonzalez? Representative Long is not there. Representative Gamash? Yes. Representative Troiano? Yes. Representative Howard votes yes. Representative Kalaki? Yes. Representative Zott? Representative Byron? Yes. Representative okay, Hango? Representative, I'm sorry, I'm sorry Representative um, Zott did vote yes on the chat. I think he has a microphone. Okay. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, we can hear you now, yeah. Can you, can you recall it or do you need to? No, please go ahead. Okay, all right. Representative Hango? Yes. Representative Stevens. Yes. Yes. 10, zero, one. Okay, and um, the reporter of the bill on back in March was Representative Walls. Um, Tommy, are you, are you prepared to uh, do this on the floor in about half an hour? Sure. Or whenever it comes up in the next? Yeah. Yeah. Sometime today. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. I think we're going to leave it there for today. I think we'll, um, we're scheduled to meet tomorrow. Um, if there's, I mean, I don't know what the floor action is going to be. I mean, given that I think the speaker was very, uh, good on time today, but depending on what bills are coming up, I think we saw the potential schedule. I would still be prepared. Um, Representative Howard, I would be prepared on H880 at any time this week um, to, to do that. Um, quite frankly, and I guess the only other bills that are hanging out there from us are H783, which I'm not sure we'll get to this week. Um, the Homeless Bill of Rights, I know we're not gonna to get to this week. Um, so we'll see what we have tomorrow. Again, I, um, I, I had originally scheduled to just sort of have a conversation about the, you know, just sort of a review to remind us before we left uh, for our break. But um, I also hear exactly what Representative Hanko was saying in terms of being pretty fried, so maybe um, maybe we will um, take uh, maybe a, maybe a, a, an email with the homework over the next two months to just say make sure you're, you're ready to work on these when we come back in August um, will be sufficient so um, Deanna um, and, and just in that just from really the learning perspective if we are able to meet at all uh, and and Mr. Chair, if you're able to perhaps make that, that email uh, before we meet and then just a, a quick gathering together from a learning perspective, it would um, keep things more accessible. Um, and so I wanted to yeah. just see if that's, if mm -hmm. knowing all yeah. the different factors and how exhausting this is, if that's possible, um, I, I would advocate for that. Yeah, so without going into detail, I'll just say S83 was the do not darken my door uh, language that um, was the same language that, what that was in the sexual harassment bill we passed two years ago it was just being applied to um, it was just being applied slightly differently s59 is the sports betting study that is coming out of the Senate um, we had a version of that up on our wall that was that was sponsored by representative Chickling last year 
Um, S226 is a, is the union bill that we, I'm not, I think we talked about it where we, um, the teachers, it was about the teachers and the school mm -hmm. boards aligning some issues regarding health insurance negotiations. What was the number again? S226. Thank you. Um, then there were two bills, two other Senate bills, um, S257, which I haven't looked at closely, which I think aligns a little bit with our H739, it was rental safety. And then S237 was a housing bill, but it also had, um, it was primarily an Act 250 bill that, may, that hasn't come over from the Senate yet anyway. So we're not gonna touch that, but those were the bills along with 738, um, I'm sorry, 783. Uh, and then that's what's on my list. And that of course is subject to change, but those were the main bills that were coming over from the Senate. Um, S83 we've had for a while um, and it passed the Senate committee unanimously and it passed the Senate itself unanimously. And so we've taken some testimony on it. I'll leave it at that without any further details. Yeah, Lisa. Can you repeat the one that has um, pieces from Act 250? I yeah, two, S-237. S-237. Thanks. And that's that hasn't come over to us yet. Um, Great. But those are the bills that we'll look at and um, that are technically still alive. It's that time of year where we, nothing's over until the gavel falls and that won't be until September. So Tom, they're, they're alive for not this week, but in September, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, once upon a time, we thought that August was going to be only about the budget, but I think it's clear that, I mean, look, we just got, we're going to, we got this bill. We dealt with it quickly because it was ours. Yep. Um, but okay. anyway, so we'll, yes, we'll make sure you can get a periodic email just to remind us of what we can look up and where we can look it up at. And, um, and then, you know, then it'll be up to us individually to remember that, oh, we did hear from some witness, like on S83, we didn't quite hear from all the witnesses that we might've heard, but we'll see if there's time. Um, and we haven't heard anything about the sports betting. We haven't heard anything about, I mean, the housing and Act 250 bill is, the fact that it has Act 250 in it means that it's mostly uh, not our bill, um, but we don't know anything about it. So we'll do what we can with it. And this is, this is a crazy time. So I will, um, if we don't have a reason to meet tomorrow, we'll cancel. And, but we won't know that until either later tonight or early tomorrow morning. And, um, so Damien, I guess, good to see you. Nice to see you too. And make sure your coworkers know we love them too. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, it's, uh, I've got Legos set up next to me here on the table that have been worked on as we go. Oh, did you get the special Golden Dome edition? <laughs> oh, no, she's, she's doing the Arctic Explorers. Maybe it's a comment on today's heat. So. Yeah. Are you and are you barefoot and will you step on the pieces as you get up from your iPad? Oh, undoubtedly I'm gonna step on something, <laughs> but it'll probably be little Moana figurines. So excellent. And yeah. um general night and um it was good to hear from you and uh please send our regards to Ken, who I, I know is there with you. Um and your company and we'll be, I'm sure we'll be in touch with you if not before we come back in August then certainly by then for another update. Outstanding, I appreciate everyone's efforts on this and, and stay safe. Thank you, General, thank you for, thank you for staying with us. Hi, Tom, Tom, I just wanna make sure I understand for any of the uh, Corona re relief but funds that our community had input on if and when the Senate changes those things and they come back to the House, 
Is our committee involved in looking at those amendments or is appropriations? Uh, I believe that we are going to have, we are going to have to have uh, a say okay. in that chunk of time. That's section 11 and 11A. Well, mostly section 11. So I would assume okay. that we'll be back together um, for that. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. I don't know whose phone that is. Oh, it's my <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you on the floor in just a few minutes.